Southern Gothic is a podcast that explores the history behind some of the American South's darkest days, greatest mysteries, and most chilling ghost stories. funeral of William Eddings Baynard was the largest that Hilton Head Island had ever seen. The affluent planter from nearby Edisto Island had passed away on May 2, 1849, and due to he and his family's prominence and success, wealthy plantation owners from all over came to Hilton Head to mourn his passing. The funeral procession began at Braddock's Point Plantation, where Baynard had passed. It then weaved through the live oak and pine tree lined roads of the island's maritime forest. At the front was a black draped wagon hearse carrying Baynard's body, and it was followed by the family's formal black carriage with his widow and children inside. Mourning relatives joined the funeral cortege as well, and enslaved men and women from all over the island gathered to watch the procession as they had been given this one day off in honor of the deceased. Upon arrival at the Zion Chapel of Ease, a pregnant Mrs. Baynard was escorted by William's brother, Ephraim, to the front pew, along with her seven children. The old wooden church was a mere 30 by 40 feet in size, so it was likely a tight fit for those present at the services. But when it finally came time to inter the beloved father in the cemetery outside, it was clear that his final resting place was fit for a king. A beautiful redstone mausoleum capable of holding 20 souls. A mausoleum that remains to this very day, almost two centuries later, the oldest surviving structure on Hilton Head Island. Baynard Mausoleum has somehow stood the test of time. Tragically, its mission to protect those interred there has not been fulfilled. As today, it sits under those moss-covered oak trees, entirely empty. A victim to over a century of vandalism and theft, making this truly unique and historic structure the center to some of the island's most infamous legends and ghost lore a legacy that continues on to this very day. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. The Zion Chapel of Ease is no longer around, but its historic cemetery is still home to the graves of numerous Hilton Head planters, Revolutionary War veterans, and of course, the Baynard family mausoleum. This tomb was unlike anything seen on the island before. The walls of the Greek Revival style mausoleum were constructed with brownstone and bluestone that was quarried in the north and shipped to Hilton Head by barge. Carolina Redstone was then used for the facade, giving the gabled mausoleum its unique red hue. The roof is limestone, and originally the entrance boasted two marble doors that unfortunately are no longer there. On either side of the entrance are upside-down torches made of marble, carvings meant to signify a life cut short. And above the door is the inscription, 
integrity, and uprightness. An iron fence fixed in granite posts surrounds the mausoleum, but in reality it has done little to protect the tomb from vandals and grave robbers. And as a result, legend says that it is now a hotbed for ghostly activity due to the supposed tragedy that William Baynard endured. A sad tale that has been passed down through the ages. According to local lore, the affluent planter acquired nearby Braddock's Point Plantation in a high-stakes game of poker with Saucy Jack Stoney, another large property owner on the island. Fortunately, this was just in time for Baynard's upcoming wedding to Catherine Adelaide Scott. And as you can imagine, his soon-to-be bride was thrilled by this news. After all, she now had her own mansion to serve as the site of a grand wedding reception. So on the day of their union, after they said their I do's at the local Zion Chapel of Ease, the pair were taken back to Braddock's Point in a magnificent black carriage with an elegant gold-colored interior. Beaming with pride and excitement, the newlyweds entered their new home and began celebrating the beginning of the rest of their lives. The reception began as expected. Music and laughter echoed through the halls and folks joyously danced the evening away. But then, after the sun had begun to set, William noticed that Catherine felt awful warm. At first, he didn't think much of it as they were dancing and celebrating but eventually, Catherine began sweating profusely, and her face now had a deep scarlet hue. Believing that his bride was merely overexerting herself on the dance floor, William attempted to take her to rest in a nearby chair, but it was already too late. The couple had not moved but a few steps before Catherine collapsed. Shocked by the sight, wedding guests rushed forward to help, but William shooed them away, immediately scooping up his trembling bride from the floor and carrying her back to their bedroom. A doctor was hastily summoned, but the prognosis was clear from the very start. Catherine had contracted a deadly fever, and much to the horror of her new husband, absolutely nothing could be done for her but sit and wait. So that is exactly what William did. That night, he diligently stayed by her side, watching Catherine struggle to take each and every breath, until finally, by morning, she was silent. William was overcome with anguish. What was to be the greatest moment of his life had now turned into the most traumatic. So the grief-stricken widower decided that there was only one thing left that he could do for his bride. Build her an exquisite place of rest that was not only worthy of her beauty, but also grand enough to convey the depths of his loss. The result was that now historic Carolina red brick tomb in the Zion Chapel of East Cemetery Legend claims that William Boehner visited the mausoleum almost every night following Catherine's internment there. He was sometimes seen sobbing violently, and others sitting silently with his shoulders drooped and his head buried in his hands. It's said that he never recovered from the loss, and when he himself died several years later, folks on the island whispered that the cause was a broken heart. Yet the couple did not have an easy rest inside that exquisite monument, as it soon became the target for grave robbers following the conclusion of the Civil War. But according to local lore, these men who dared disturb the Baynards' peace did so at their own peril. One man was killed by a tile that fell from the roof of the grave. 
Another managed to successfully get inside the crypt, but in doing so he failed to secure the door behind him, leaving him trapped inside with no way to escape. A truly horrific punishment for his crime. For years, no one actually knew that this man had been trapped until one day another thief dared to force his way in. But upon opening that heavy door, the rotting remains of the previous vandal crashed down upon him, sending him into a fear-filled fit of anxiety so severe that he suffered a fatal heart attack right there in that cemetery. As you can expect, these happenings didn't exactly temper the stories being shared around Hilton Head that this mausoleum is haunted. Visitors have reported hearing the disembodied sounds of a desperate and heartbroken individual wailing from grief, cries that echo through the human island night. Others have reportedly seen the apparition of a couple dressed in antebellum clothing, standing near the door of the Baynard Mausoleum. But it's said that when these individuals are approached, they seemingly vanish into thin air, as if they were never there in the first place. Who these apparitions are is unknown, but most believe they are the souls of William and Catherine, reunited in death. Of course, with a legacy that looms as large as William Baynard's, these aren't the only places where people claim to have encountered a spirit. What was once Baynard's Grand Mansion on Braddock's Point Plantation is now known as the Stony Baynard Ruins. The mansion burned down back in 1867, but today some of the decaying walls remain, as well as the foundations of several slave quarters. The short trail that leads visitors to the site from Plantation Drive has been deemed by some to be the, quote, creepiest hike in South Carolina. Not only has William Baynard's ghost purportedly been seen wandering the grounds at night, but eerily, some have also claimed to witness a spectral funeral procession slowly making its way from the ruins to the Baynard Mausoleum. Yet who this ghostly funeral procession is for is up for debate. Because if you didn't notice, the legend that I told you about the tragic death of a bride on her wedding day doesn't quite add up to the description of William's funeral that I opened with in this episode. So it seems that much like most ghost stories we cover, Hilton Head Island's local lore ain't gonna let the truth get in the way of a good story. We'll explore some of these differences as well as the actual history of the Baynard family, their plantation, and their mausoleum after the break. This week's episode of Southern Gothic is sponsored by HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit. With HelloFresh, you get farm fresh, pre-portioned ingredients, and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep so you can skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. But y'all, if you really want to know why I personally use this meal kit, no joke, it's because this is the one that my kids actually like. And since every week I get to pick from 40 recipes that vary from all sorts of different preferences, sometimes I actually even get to introduce a little variety into their diet as well. I mean, you parents know what that's like, right? But not only have we been able to get some pretty classic meals like meatloaf and pork chops with mashed potatoes, but them enjoying those meals from HelloFresh has actually led them to trust me enough that the other night I put some goat cheese chicken on the table and y'all, I didn't hear a single complaint. 
Obviously, this has been absolutely wonderful. It's given me the opportunity to try new stuff without the hassle of finding new recipes and heading to the grocery store looking for ingredients and doing that whole mess when honestly, sometimes I am just swamped with trying to get this darn podcast out. So if you are interested in trying out America's number one meal kit, then go to HelloFresh.com slash Gothic60 and use the code Gothic60 for 60% off plus free shipping. You heard that right. 60% off plus free shipping. All you got to do is go to HelloFresh.com slash Gothic60 and use code Gothic60. What are y'all waiting for? Go feed them kids. When William Eddings Baynard came into possession of Braddock's Point Plantation, he was far from the young man portrayed in legend. Born on February 12, 1800, he hailed from a family of wealthy cotton planters. Their primary crop was Sea Island cotton, a highly profitable strain unique to the Low Country. Over the years, Baynard grew his wealth even more and although he primarily operated from Edisto Island, he eventually came to own and manage numerous plantations throughout the region, inheriting the Spanish Wells Plantation from his father and then purchasing Muddy Creek Plantation from his uncle's estate. Then, by 1820, Baynard had amassed enough wealth to purchase Buckingham Plantation on the South Carolina mainland. Now, while legend claims that Baynard acquired Braddock's Point Plantation through a high-stakes poker game prior to marrying Catherine, neither of these statements is accurate. Pear married on July 19, 1829, and he didn't acquire the now-historic property on Hilton Head until 1845, well after the couple had already started their family. As for that game of poker, well, it didn't actually happen. The Stoney family actually lost ownership of the property to their creditors, and William Baynard purchased it from the Bank of Charleston for roughly $10,000. This not only included the mansion and other structures, but also 1,200 acres of land at a price equivalent to about $400,000 today. Captain Jack Stoney was the original owner of the property. Born in Ireland, Stoney arrived in colonial South Carolina around 1774, and as the ship's captain, he served as a privateer during the American Revolution, amassing a fortune for himself. In 1776, he acquired the thousand acres of land at Braddock's Point on Hilton Head, but it wasn't until the war ended that he began construction on the mansion that the Baynard family would one day call home. Utilizing a crew of enslaved men, the mansion was constructed atop a bluff overlooking the Calabos Sound, 24 feet above sea level. The result was a beautiful two-story, 40 by 46 foot mansion. The first floor was used primarily as a basement and built with the unique coastal concrete known as tabby, a material made from oyster shells, sand, and ash. The second story of the home was wood-framed with clapboard siding, allowing for large windows and doors that could be opened for cooling of the house. A grand stairway stood at the front of the mansion, leading up to a large front porch that extended around the house and was spacious enough for entertaining guests. While living there on the island, Captain Stoney spent most of his time fishing and hunting with his friend and fellow planter William Pope. Unfortunately, in 1821, during one of these hunting trips at Pope's Fish Hall Plantation, tragedy struck. The men and their sons were riding horseback through the trees, flushing game toward the marsh for a clear shot. But when the 72-year-old captain stopped to adjust a stirrup, the musket he was carrying slipped and discharged, shattering his skull and killing him on the spot. In an effort to spare his mother and the rest of the family from the sight, old Jack's son buried his father precisely where he fell. 
After this, the plantation passed through the hands of several generations of the Stoney family until finally they could no longer afford to keep it. And this is how William Eddings Baynard came into possession of the home. Until this time, Baynard and his family lived primarily on Edisto Island. But it seems that after this purchase on Hilton Head, he and his wife planned to make the island their permanent home. As the following year, in 1846, construction began on that now infamous family mausoleum. Interestingly enough, though, this construction doesn't seem to have been the result of a family tragedy, as the legend suggests. That being said, the mausoleum was in fact the most impressive tomb seen on Hilton Head at the time, boasting space for up to 20 people. But once again, contrary to the legend, it wasn't Catherine to be interred there first, but rather William Baynard himself. He died on May 2, 1849, likely the result of yellow fever. He was survived by Catherine, seven children, and an eighth who would be born only months after his death. Baynard was 49 years old at the time. Catherine joined her beloved only six years later, on May 29, 1854. She was only 41. Then over the next few years leading up to the Civil War, there were at least five more internments in the mausoleum. But in November of 1861, as United States forces invaded the island, the Baynard family and other wealthy landowners fled Hilton Head for the safety of the mainland. Now abandoned, the home was raided by federal troops and it served as a headquarters for their occupation during the conflict. Then, in the aftermath of the war, the government seized all island property, and when the family did not come forward to pay the taxes, penalties, and interest of $155, the government purchased the property at auction for a mere $845. However, the mansion did not stand for much longer. Sometime between August and December 1867, a fire broke out in the two-story home, the cause of the blaze is unknown, although some believe that it was started by the U.S. troops when they finally left the island, while others claim that it was a band of ex-Confederate raiders hoping to find valuables inside. Either way, the fire left the mansion in ruins. But the plantation house wasn't the only victim of vandals. As the legend claims, the mausoleum was frequently targeted by treasure hunters, vandals, and opportunists. It's unknown when this first occurred, although it likely began during the Civil War. Evidence of this comes from Reverend John Jenkins Stoney, who returned to the Zion Chapel in 1869, hoping to resume services there. But instead, he found that the chapel had been ransacked and all of its contents gone. Reverend Stoney didn't mention the condition of the cemetery, but a newspaper article from 1929 stated that a number of Hilton Head locals believed that at least one or two of the family members interred there were, quote, despoiled during the Confederate War by soldiers looking for treasure. This is, of course, a secondhand report, but given the state that Reverend Stoney found the chapel to be in, it does seem quite plausible. A 1901 article from the Columbia, South Carolina newspaper, The State, offers the most intriguing tale of them all. It reports that a physician was traveling on horseback when he noticed something strange at the cemetery. As he drew closer, he found that the, quote, doors of the mausoleum were broken and hanging from their hinges. Intrigued, he decided to investigate further, and what he discovered was a scene of utter chaos. Seven coffins, quote, strewn about the grounds and into the marsh. Five of them were made of wood, while the other two were iron, known as Fisk burial cases. These special coffins were reserved for the wealthy and featured a glass window through which the face of the deceased could be seen. 
but what really caught the physician's attention was that one of the iron coffins was cracked open. Looking through the glass faceplate, he saw the, quote, long blonde hair of a woman who must have been a beauty in life. So intrigued and clearly a brave man, he then reached through the crack to feel her skin, which he found to be, quote, as supple as though she had been buried the day before. If this was, in fact, Catherine Baynard, as one would assume by the description, about a half of a century would have passed between her burial and the physician's encounter with her remains. The article pointed out that Fisk burial cases were in fact designed to be airtight and preserve human remains, so this eerie discovery might very well be entirely true. Sadly, though, the wooden coffins did not fare as well. When the physician looked inside, he saw only, quote, a most gruesome dust. On May 29, 1927, another reference to vandalism was published in the state. It said, quote, One marble door on hinges still hangs and works perfectly. The other has been broken away. Within are 20 sections for receiving coffins, and six of these are occupied. Two of the coffins are of cast iron, formed to hold snugly the bodies of their dead, but time has done its work and the bottoms of these coffins have rusted away and are now convenient places for rats to build their nests among the bones of the departed. The other coffins are all of heart pine, and except for having been broken open by vandals in search of jewelry, are still in good condition. On the floor of the vault is a coffin containing bones and some scraps of clothing. If these conditions weren't bad enough, the skull was missing from the open coffin and later found, quote, outside the garden fence. Given its size, it was assumed that this was the skull of a woman. Then, in 1953, the descendants of the Baynard family finally removed whatever remains were still there so that they could be adequately protected elsewhere, leaving the mausoleum empty for what has now been 70 years. Although, in recent excavations done by the University of South Carolina, artifacts like jewelry and human bones were found still inside the monument, including vertebrae, ribs, a hip bone, and a sternum. The county coroner inspected the remains and said that some likely belonged to a child about 10 years old. But after DNA analysis, it was found that the remains were of two different individuals, one of which was Catherine Baynard. In 2018, restoration work began on the Baynard Mausoleum. An attempt to restore and preserve the island's oldest surviving structure for the future. And although no member of the Baynard family remains inside, it has not stopped visitors from dropping by in the hopes of encountering the spirit of William Eddings Baynard or his beautiful bride. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independent podcast produced by siblings Brianne and Brandon Schecksneider, but made possible through the support of listeners like you. If you're a fan of the show and would like to help make sure that Southern Gothic continues on, consider becoming a supporter over on Patreon or become a premium subscriber on the Apple Podcast app. Lucky Little Shacks.